Hi, everybody. Sorry, guys. Okay, we're on air. We're on air. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to please put your um, computer on mute when you're not speaking so we don't get uh, an echo. So um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for on this Google Hangout during anti during International anti student Harassment Week. Uh, I am the president of the first virtual chapter of the National Organization for Women called Young Feminists and Allies. And we tied as a virtual chapter, what better way to celebrate International anti student Harassment Week than holding a Google Hangout, which is how we usually hold our um, meetings. And I will um, hand the mic over to Holly Curl, the founder of International anti student Harassment Week in just a moment. But I uh, just wanted to say a little bit more about us. So we are the Young Feminists and Allies chapter. You can find us on Twitter at Now Young Fems, our Facebook groups, Now YFA. We do ask you to please tweet in questions or email us, youngfeminists at gmail.com. During the Google Hangout, any questions or comments you might have. Um, and without further ado, I would like to hand things over to Holly Carl, uh, who's just really started this international movement to make all women safer. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Jaren. Thank you so, so much for hosting this. Um, it's really a, a nice way to kick off the week by talking about um, just how, how complex and varied street harassment is. Um, I, I founded and started the organization Stop Street Harassment, um, and well, it started as a, a website in 2008. And in the course of researching this issue for my blog and for a book that came out in 2010, um, I realized that there were people all over the world who were working on this issue. So five years ago, I thought, why don't we all amplify each other's voices and come together on the same day and take action around street harassment and really have solidarity together on this issue and elevate the issue um, globally. And the day was successful and became a week the next year. So this is the fourth year that it's been a week and the fifth year overall of, of participating uh, globally together on this. Um, and we have groups in 36 countries taking part this year, which is our, our biggest year by far. Um, so thank you, uh, everyone who, all, all the panelists for joining us this evening or morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> and, um, and thank you, everyone who's watching. So, uh, and I'm based in Washington, D.C., to give a geographic dot for where I am right now. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if the, the participants can um, each introduce themselves, and then we'll get going with the conversation. So maybe, um, uh, looks like Morningstar, I don't think you're on mute, so maybe do you want to go first? Yeah, sorry about earlier. It took me a minute there. My computer was having issues. But, um, my name is Morningstar Angeline. Um, I am Native American descent, primarily Navajo, Chippewa, Cree, Shoshone, and Blackfoot tribes. But I am also from, I have ancestry from Mexico as well. And so I've lived in New Mexico for the last two years, but I was born here and I've off and on always come back. And um, the other place that I lived was also California. So that's kind of my geographical spots where I resided, but um, I've been very passionate regarding street harassment issues and just general other how street harassment is kind of just this subcategory of this bigger issue and so all of those issues really are drawn to me. Thank you so much. Um, Hisumi, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Kasumi. Um, I am a Japanese national, but my ethnicity is Chinese. And I grew up in both China and Japan, and I went to college for four years in the United States. So um, I am kind of like from everywhere, and I just always move around a lot, and I've seen a lot of um, gender dynamics that are very diverse. So hopefully um, my experience in living in Japan and China and the United States can um, help people learn more about what's going on in the world. So yeah. 
accept my self-introduction. Thank you. I love writing. Yeah, you were a blog correspondent for Stop Street Harassment last year. A great one. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, one of your essays will be in a, a new book that will be out in August about global street harassment activism. Wow. Okay, and uh, Manira. Hi, everyone. I'm Manira. Um, I'm 18 years old, and I'm a student in Richmond, Virginia. I grew up outside of Boston, and I moved to Nova, and I'm in Richmond, so I've been a, up and down the East Coast a bit. Um, I'm Bengali, Amer or Bangladeshi American, and I wear a hijab, which is the headscarf that I'm wearing right now. Um, I got into the topic of street harassment in high school over an English project, actually, and since then I've been really interested in um, kind of talking about how our experiences as very different um, women overlap when it comes to this issue. So, thank you. Thank you. And you were a, a social media volunteer for a bit last summer for Stop Street Crossman. So thank you for that. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, so, so street harassment is incredibly complex. Um, it's a lot of it is about um, it's a reflection of discrimination that exists in our societies. So people's identities can intersect, other identities beyond gender can intersect with gender um, to create unique experiences of street harassment um, across individuals. And so I think it's really useful for, um, for everyone, those who are harassed and those who aren't, to learn about these differences and to kind of better understand the complexities involved in street harassment. So that's something that we wanted to discuss this evening, is just talk to each of you um, about the experiences that you've had with street harassment and how you think um, maybe it's unique or, or not unique. It doesn't have to just solely focus on that. But you know, anything that you feel like um, would help us all better understand street harassment and the, and the complexities there. So um, and, and it's welcome to be a conversation, too, so it doesn't have to just go one, two, three, one, two, three, back and forth like that. Um, but feel free to respond to each other. And you know, if, if something someone says prompts you to remember something else, like feel free to, to go ahead and chat. I think we have. Um, a good uh, 20 minutes or so to, to have a conversation um, before we start talking about, we'll, we'll then talk about sort of solutions and ideas for what we can do for the latter half. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So does anyone so want to pick it off by starting, off by starting to share some of your experiences? Um, sure. Um, I, sure. Have I have some statistics some that I kind of wanted to drop wanted here, to drop <laughs> if that's all right. That's all right. All right. So, all right. Um, so as I said um, before, I'm of Native, Native American descent, American descent. and um, um, we face kind of unique issues. I wouldn't say that no one else faces these issues, but um, okay, so here's some of those statistics that Native American women face. Um, strangers commit 41% of sexual assault slash rape um, among Native American women, and that is a staggering statistic, being that most rapes are not triggered by or do not happen from strangers. It's from like a family member, someone you know, but within the Native American community it's those strangers because of different laws and um, restrictions that exist on the reservation and off. And for those who don't know, reservations are a place that were created for Native Americans to live within the United States and those places have their own laws and treaties and different things, but that's a broader subject. So. Um, one in three experience rape or attempted rape and were twice as likely as any other race to experience that rape. So for me, um, I'm very aware of these statistics when I go out, when I'm walking on the street, it determines or it plays a very big role in what I wear, um, depending on if I'm by myself, if I'm with other people because I know that statistically I am more likely to be attacked. Um, and so I don't know, I know that different races play different roles into your odds of being attacked, and so I'm sure you guys also have some ideas as to, I mean, different ways you're targeted as far as your ethnicity, and that definitely plays a very big role. 
So I'll leave it to you guys. I don't want to steal the show. <laughs> Um, no, I'm going to go ahead and jump in and say that I totally agree with you. Um, even though we have very different experiences as you were talking about your statistics, um, I think it's really important for us to know what, I guess, in a way we're up against. For me personally, um, shoot harassment wasn't really a thing that I considered an issue because of the way that I dress. But as you were saying, it it's um, statistically, it's still something that affects us. So I'm kind of interested in when you guys realized that this was an issue for you. Um, for me personally, I think I was like 10 years old and I was at the grocery store and I had smiled at somebody and my mother was like, Mira, don't do that. And I was like, what? Like, why wouldn't I smile at people? And that's kind of when it hit me that it doesn't matter that I dress the way I do. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter that you would think that Islam is kind of associated with, oh, I'm not interested in that. Um, it really is undiscriminatory in a way when it comes to all of us kind of facing our respective issues. Wow, 10 years old? Um, actually, street harassment didn't hit me as there's, um, as an issue until I was in college. Um, because I've always looked like a child, so I guess nobody really realized I was already a developed woman. So I, um, once I was in college, I was one of very few Asian girls in rural Pennsylvania. And a lot of street harassment, almost half of them, are tailored specifically for Asian girls. And the ear, um, I forgot if it was uh, 2013 or 2014, um, 2012, the ear Gangnam Style got really popular. I really hated that song because people like street harassers try to quote side all the time, and I just really didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> makes me cringe. <laughs> yeah, it was like a uh, cringe. Please yeah. don't use that sexy lady line. Oh, God. <laughs> this is what I mean. I mean, different races face different types of street harassment because those mm -hmm. sayings or phrases that are thrown at us during the, the street harassment are often geared directly towards what we look like. I mean, for me, I, I endured street harassment in, I don't know, say, eighth grade in the U.S., um, so that's probably around my age 13, 14. And to be quite honest, I can remember having more street harassment happen to me when I was younger than I do now, which disturbs me further because I was younger, my body wasn't as well developed, it was still developing, and that was primarily when I'd be walking home from school and that's when people get off work and so there's traffic and they're yelling and they're, hey, and, it, and growing up with that, for me, it was like, what's your ideal scenario for me to be like, yeah, like stop your car and let me come in, like what? So it's obviously about the power they're asserting. They're saying that they have the power to use those words and you can't do anything about it. Um, if you do, you're perceived as the one victimizing yourself, which I find a hor a horrible idea that um, us even having this Google Hangout is somehow us trying to victimize them so ourselves. That's how some people view it. It's like, it's a compliment. And I just find that even more disgusting. <laughs> I definitely agree with you. Um, as I mentioned, I did a project in high school, and I surveyed dozens of um, people who identified as girls. And I think the average age for the stories that they gave me were like 10, 11, 12. And yeah. again, that is terrifying. It's terrifying because they start so young. and we're kind of conditioned to accept it. Be like, okay, it, they're trying to be nice, or it doesn't really mean anything. But once you get to, you know, at least for me, it was 17, 18, where I was like, wait, this isn't cool. Um, by the time that you're able to kind of fight back for yourself, it's gone to, or started with, you know, the younger generation. So I think it's really important for us to kind of break through what people think is normal because it's not normal to feel unsafe. It's not 
something that we as children and as we grow up should feel that we need to deal with. Definitely, definitely. There's this idea too, speaking directly about women who endure that street harassment, it's like like there's this idea that we dress a certain way, we present ourselves a certain way for the sole idea of getting that attention back. And that's a very one-sided idea that yet, yeah, like I don't get up, I don't put my makeup on for you or for him or for anyone else, I do it for me and that's not an invitation. My body existing isn't an invitation. I think the idea is that's what you're... Oops, sorry. Do you want to go ahead, Kasumi? I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. You can go first. Okay. I'm just going to say that the idea that what you're wearing kind of puts you as a target is so antiquated, and it's something that you still hear all the time. And growing up, I mean, if I had thought that for a moment, then it was, you know, erased immediately because... For me, I wear a hijab. My sister wears a hijab. She covers herself, you know, very well. And my friends, you know, they'll walk out with shorts. And it doesn't matter. All of us have stories to share. And the idea that someone was somehow asking for it is disgusting because it has nothing to do with the person receiving it. It's everything to do with what's wrong with cat collars and the people who are dishing it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I definitely agree that what, what you wear shouldn't matter, but it still does. And I feel like um, Japan has taken it too far with the women-only car. I've written about it on Holly's blog before. And um, I think Japan is not the only country to do it, but I just don't like the idea of confining women to this one or two particular cars out of all the train cars and it's like why do we need to be in this one place like I should like I think it should be a better idea to just have a harassers only cars instead of women because we're not criminals they are yeah <laughs> there's this whole thing with women like we're supposed to supply the answer to the to these issues and I find that very, and this will come up when we discuss um, solutions, but it's like women are just a very small piece of that solution. Um, and I think the victim blaming is a very scary part, and that's why when I'm getting ready to go out and I, I'm like, okay, what am I going to be doing today? I'm going to be by myself. What should I wear? Because sadly, a street harassment can turn into a sexual assault, and it's not like we have a crystal ball of when that event will happen so we prepare ourselves every time it happens and I think that's why um, oftentimes when you're out in public spaces you see women with like these straight stoic faces and that's because we are we have our game face on we have we're ready to protect ourselves we don't look people in the eye because that's an invitation and smiling at a stranger is an invitation and I think that's a little bit too much of us to have to police ourselves in public spaces when we're not promoting it even if I was wearing like a bra with shorts and stuff that's still not invitation but I don't do that because if something happened it's like they would blame me more than they blame the man what was she dressed like <laughs> and even if I am in sweats it, it still happens so it's it's not as clear-cut as just it's targeted towards the the people wearing revealing clothing, it's everywhere. And people of, that are not women, the LGBT members, the, um, I'm, I'm sure men, various men who look different ways, they get it too. I mean, this isn't just a women's issue at all. Um, you all brought this up a little bit as we getting, but I feel like sometimes street harassers are just so uh, lazy and they immediately do jump to stereotypes mm -hmm. and just repeating things like in the media like the gangnam style or I don't, you know whatever else is is uh, that they associate with a certain race and then they'll just blurt that out 
um, like idiots. But uh, but then yes, there's that like underlying sense of, of concern and fear, and it starts at such a young age. Um, one of my board members, Dr. Laura S. Logan, is doing research on teenage girls and street harassment, and she said something interesting to me um, a couple of days ago. She's exploring the idea of street harassment as a form of grooming um, of girls to be uh, to to accept discrimination as women in that various makes ways. Makes sense. Yeah, so I, I really have been thinking a lot about that. Um, anyway, so just a couple of things I want to you know. Do you feel like stereotypes do come into play in street harassment you experience? And if anyone wanted to talk more about the young age and kind of the impact it's had on you now as you're older, even if it's, I know Manira, you're still quite young, but even, you know, compared to a couple of years ago, like what is the impact on you? Thanks. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I know I threw I threw out two different things, so whatever you want to respond to is fine. Okay. Um, well, we'll start with the young age. So I'm 18, like I mentioned, um, and street traffic. I think it's something that my mother started kind of warning me about at a young age. Like we were saying earlier, 10, 11, 12 is kind of. Um, when things start getting very serious. And I remember I was doing, my project was um, that the front, I was doing embroidery hoops. So the front of the hoop was kind of the, an, an illustration of the situation. On the back of the hoop was a um, quote about the situation from a survivor. And my personal one, um, it only had initials. So people didn't know which ones were related to me and which ones weren't. And when it happened, I was 12, I think, a specific situation, and I was on a, um, a ride in, like, not Disneyland, but it was um, the Universal, I think it was. So this is supposed to be one of the happiest days of my life, you know? You're on a roller coaster, and there was a man sitting next to me, and I won't go into details, but um, it made me feel very, very uncomfortable. And... I remember because I was so young, I didn't know how to respond to this. And I was like, he's a grown man. You know, I'm sure like this isn't what I think it is. I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm saying. So as I left the cart, you know, after the little ride or whatever, I looked at him and I smiled. And that's the quote I had on the back of my project that when I left I smiled. And one of um, a male adult had read it and said, Oh, well she smiled at him. How was he supposed to know? What I said was, well, she was 11 years old. What was she supposed to do? And I think that that's kind of an idea that people try to use, but as children, I don't think that we need to be, or we should ever be kind of um, responsible to not how to respond to these situations. And if you don't respond correctly, then you were asking for it. Um, so that was something that stuck with me um, as I kind of go forward. Yeah, there definitely isn't a rule book as to how a, a young woman should um, respond to advances, especially by a grown-up. I mean, um, I've had, and this isn't exactly street harassment, but some people, the things that they're okay with saying to someone under the age of 17, 18, and they expect them to answer in a way that speaks for that that child and a child isn't of an age to even speak for themselves you know that's why we have various laws in different countries even it's to protect the child's voice because they shouldn't have a voice they sh they it's our duty to protect them first off as a society and so the blame definitely should not be in those who are still children and how they react to that, whether they accept it. I mean, when you're young, a compliment's a compliment to a degree. You don't know what certain things mean. Like certain things when I was younger that people would, phrases they threw out their car, I didn't even know what they meant because I was too young. And they're, of course, extremely sexual, extremely awful and etc but when you're that age you don't even know what it means 
So I think that's a really interesting topic. I mean, if I did have a child, I highly doubt I would let that child walk home by themselves just because not so much the fear of them getting raped, but the harassment itself, that can leave scars beyond, um, I guess, PTSD. It's more how you view yourself, like like you were saying, like how has it influenced how you view yourself, and you kind of sexualize yourself. It probably puts you in a, to a situation where you would pursue sexual activities more, would you guys say, because you're exposed to that, so it kind of makes you think, what is this? Like, what is it that they said? And so you, it kind of triggers that, um, your sexual awakening to a degree it makes you curious. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that after my experience in that, you know, um, in the roller coaster, I guess, I had no idea what was going on. And afterwards, it was definitely terrifying for me because we hadn't talked about anything like that in health class. So that, for me, definitely started, you know, some, like, very desperate Google searches, like, what is going on right now? Um, and it wasn't something I was comfortable talking to my parents to at the time. So it, you're absolutely right. It starts you thinking about things that you shouldn't have to. And it's almost, I mean, it is unhealthy at that age, especially if your view of sexuality is kind of spurred by a negative experience. Um, exactly. I can't imagine what kind of, you know, impacts that will have on me in the future. That's not where it have gone down yet, but it will be. Well, kind of like I said, um, I was a late bloomer um, in the sense and that I started receiving street harassment later and also started develop developing later. So I can't really say for sure. Um, how I would feel if I were younger when I um, first received street harassment, but I feel like it could go both ways. Some people can start their sexual awakening earlier, and some others might just be withdrawn to um, communicating with um, the same people, the same sex, people of the different sex. But I feel like it just um, depends on the personality of the person mm -hmm. and also the environment. Yeah, yeah. I think you brought something um, very important into it as well, and that's just the educational aspect of it. Um, how, what, when exactly are, are, is like the health, the sex talk a part of the curriculum in school and as we know, girls tend to develop far earlier than boys, and the development varies in the individual. So I think that's also a very important, um, I guess, sub area of this is just where education and its place in this discussion of sexual harassment and what we should be teaching and how early we start that conversation because I guess in the real world that conversation is forced upon us and we need to adjust accordingly. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great moment to start um, sharing a couple ideas and solutions about what we can do because that is like one of the number one things that I want is, is uh, education and discussions with, with kids starting around age 10 or 11 if not younger because that's when it's starting, and I think that um, boys who are the main people harassing both boys and girls are under a lot of pressure, too, to fit into this man box that includes harassing people and, and doing mm -hmm. gender policing and saying, um, you know, sexualizing, sexualizing girls and then gender policing boys and girls to try to make them fit into a box of man or woman. So that really intersects with the harassment LGBTQ people experience. Um, so. Yeah, just if you all have other, you know, thoughts beyond education for for youth, which is so important, anything at an individual level or community level that you think we need to do, um, as especially if it, noting that communities can be different, and so one response in one community may not work in another. So, is there anything you feel would work better in a community you're part of? Um. 
Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I live in Tokyo, Japan right now, and sexism here is very ingrained into the local culture because um, the Japanese um, I don't know, ideologies are founded on Confucianism and Shinto and also Buddhism. And I don't know really um, much about Shinto, but the other two ideologies always value men over women. And um, so, for example, I serve tea to clients where I work right now, and men never really do that. And it's thought of as natural part of life. It's what women do. Like you serve tea to clients. So I feel like there needs to be um, educational courses implemented in school um, about um, sexism, gender, how we view gender, and also critical thinking classes. Because people rarely question their um, situations, their um, you know beliefs. I feel like there's too little questioning going on. I definitely agree with that, and especially when it comes to things that aren't necessarily as clear cut as we think they are. Um, growing up, like in the case of gender, sometimes when people don't understand, their first response is to react, you know, to be mean, to not understand. And that, I think, at least some of it can hopefully be um, eradicated by kind of normalizing it at a young age, trying to, because it doesn't work to keep yourself in a box up until, I mean, for me, it was college. You go to college, you meet all these new different types of people. But um, if we start that at a younger age, kind of introducing the idea that, hey, you don't have to do this to be a man, and you don't have to have this to be a woman, and these are kind of roles that you think you have to play, but you don't. Um, that's a very kind of serious topic that I think should be introduced at a younger age. Another thing that I think that we could do, um, I guess it's not quite education-wise, but to let people know that you're allowed to say something when you're uncomfortable. I go to VCU right now, and VCU is under construction. So we have tons and tons of construction workers coming in and out. These are men who are not affiliated with the school, and there has not been one incident. And I was talking to my, or one incident that's been reported that I know of. And I was talking to a professor about it, and I was like, oh, like considering the stereotypes and the statistically that there are so many men in this environment, you would think that there would be an issue. And she said, preemptively, the university has a responsibility to make sure that the students are comfortable. So either they had a very serious conversation with everyone coming in, or they only hired people that they knew would be able to kind of reciprocate well. But your, at least, um, your community, in my case, would be my university, has a responsibility to make sure that you're safe. And you're allowed to come up and be like, hey, this is what's going on. You guys need to do something about it. I think that something that we don't necessarily think we can do. Yeah, those are some really, really good points that you're bringing up. Um, I stopped attending a university a couple years ago, so I was only there two, two times. So my, I guess my community is generally actually just like the city. Um, I don't I mean, my commute is just literally work home, and if I go out, so, and I think it, it it gets bigger and bigger. The problem does at least when you get into bigger spaces and into communities that are shared by numerous ethnicities with different beliefs and stuff. And so, I think at the core, the easiest way to address that big that big city um, street harassment issue is through like public schools and then if you have the other demographics of like if you had a school on the reservation you would approach that differently through that culture and everything. Um, I'm not quite sure if there are any current anti-street harassments regarding the Native American community community that would be actually really interesting to look into but um, I think really it's 
the safest way is through the education system and I think arguably not just universities owe that much but like public schools that teach elementary and kindergarten I mean all of these things could these battles these small battles could be won if they were taught at a younger age so I think beyond that it's just I mean I I don't know with I'm sure you guys have seen like BuzzFeed and different things have done where they've remade and they have someone dress up in a certain amount of, in certain attire and they go out and see how much they're harassed and there's a couple videos that have gotten quite a lot of views and I would say that that is the solution but I don't want it to be I don't want people's experiences only to be validated when a BuzzFeed video is made about it you know I think that there it should be addressed in a more serious way and um, also in a way that doesn't belittle the voices of those who have been assaulted and only validate those who are like cis white people going out and dressing up a certain way and they experience and they're like it's real what they say is real and it's like come on <laughs> so yeah I, again I'm just gonna have to reiterate the education option because it seems like the best bet I think that um there's also kind of a weird stigma about talking about these issues when it comes to like nice communities when you're not in the city. I grew up, um, well I didn't grow up, but I went to high school in a very, you know, kind of affluent, like suburban outside of DC. Um, you know, theoretically a really great place to live, and it was, but um, street harassment wasn't a thing that you talked about. It was almost like it didn't happen. And, I remember sitting in my English class talking about my project, and as girls or as people identified as girls would come out and tell their stories, it would just spark, you know, everyone around them being like, "That's happening to me too." And it was very cathartic because it was almost like something we weren't allowed to talk about. But oh, this is a nice community. This is a good neighborhood. That wouldn't happen here. And I think that pretending that it doesn't, especially you know, up until we hit the age where we can't ignore it anymore is dangerous. I think that um, it's starting kind of your experiences, like we said earlier, with sexuality in a terrible way. So starting younger, like you said, and kind of having these frank discussions is, is essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think having a safe place for these discussions, as you just said, is a very big deal. I mean, not how many designated safe spaces are there for this kind of discussion where um, it's kind of like just open discussion. There, and I think that would benefit a lot of a lot of men and boys because they don't understand this issue. They're not a woman. They're not a member of the LGBTQ community who often are the victims of these types of things. So I think. Um, implementing some kind of place for men to talk about it and maybe hear the me the hear it from a guy. I think um, if we were able to do that and have like not just a woman talking to men, but have a man explain why this is wrong for men. I mean, these things, as we said, it's not just a woman's issue. It it affects men in a bad way. Um, it's not as direct, but it does happen. Um, actually, my home university, um, Penn State, has a nonprofit project started. Um, well, it started back in 2008-2009. I don't know the ex exact year, but uh, it's called worldandconversation.org, and they do a lot of conversations on social issues, and the professor and his um, groups often talk about street, uh, not street harassment in very specific ways or anything, but they talk about sexism and what women experience when they're out in the public space versus men. And also they talk about race and classes and intersectionality. It's still introductory. Um, it's tied with an introductory courses and it's a very popular class to go to and uh, when 
a student goes to that class and takes that class, um, they're required to participate in one of the group talks and discussions <coughs> that um, World in Conversation hosts. So I think that could be one of the places that can provide safe space for men to talk talk about um, sexual harassment as well and also hear from the women about their real raw experiences. Yeah, I think that yeah. would be a very good idea. I mean, it starts with educating those who are often the assailant. I mean, that really we can, I think it would also be a good idea, and I'm sure the information is out there, to um, give women kind of tips on how to react to street harassment, because at a young age, when I was like 12, I, I remember I would just get mad. <laughs> I would just like flip them off and yell like, screw you or something, but as as looking back at a 12 year old, I mean that, that kind of puts yourself in danger there. So I think I know there's a lot of girls who probably react the same way because you don't know better and you have anger, you, you want to be able to walk home and not be harassed. but um, I think that would be not a solution to the problem at all because again, it's not our problem. We didn't create it, but we need to continue to create safe spaces for all parties involved and um, I think getting the education out there for the guys and then also just letting girls know that there's a safe space to talk about it and to to um, report it, I guess. I mean, if you are experiencing street harassment from a, someone at your school, like a teacher, something like that, all of these things need to be addressed because street harassment kind of appears to be seen as a less like the lesser evil of all the assaults that can happen. Street, I mean, like we said, some people even argue that it's a compliment. So we're still winning the battle to even say that it is an assault. And so with that, we need to create safe spaces for the victims of that assault and alternatives to say when this girl walks home every day from school. Okay, how can we get her home in a safe way so she doesn't have to endure that assault? I don't know. Um, I wanted to jump into the question that Jaren had typed because that was something that I kind of faced um, when I was in high school trying to work on my project. Um, so it's, it's scary to try to bring up this issue with your friends. It's something that is usually, at least for me, was very kind of a personal thing that I tried to, I hadn't talked about, you know, my experience for years before it came up again. And I it's hard to take the first step, but I think that if you want to start a conversation with your friend, the best thing that I've had, you know, the best luck that I've had is to start with talking about your experiences and talk about, you know, this happened to me and it's happened to me before and I know that, you know, this isn't something you usually talk about, but it's really affected me. And if they're your friends, then they'll listen. It's just, it's scary to think that, you know, you're not safe, but, um, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, one of the questions that had come up that said um, her uh, question was being asked saying that friends didn't want to talk about street harassment. So um, kind of my response to that is to start with an open discussion about yours and how it makes you feel and your friends, if they're good friends, will kind of get into that comfortable space where you can have a conversation. I think um, there also needs to be a differentiation of what constitutes harassment and what constitutes what isn't a harassment. I mean, we're, we're by no means, I think I can speak for us as a group, we're not saying that conversations cannot be created within spaces between strangers safely. That's fully possible. But what we're talking about specifically is when that turns into harassment, when, when the person no longer feels safe. And I didn't want to interrupt, so go ahead. <laughs> um, I think it's so vague, but whenever someone makes me feel powerless is when harassment begins. 
they, they can physically corner me or just try to block me. I'm a small person, so it's like really easy to make me uh, feel uncomfortable as a stranger. And sometimes I have um, reproductive conversations with strangers, and it's really hard to draw a line. But whenever I think it's whenever somebody tries to talk talk about my body without talking about their bodies that I think, oh, something's wrong here. I don't know if it, it makes sense. Oh, I think like with, um, with sexual, other forms of sexual abuse, it's about power control, it's about disrespect, it's about a lack of consent. It's, you know, it's about forcing a conversation um, onto, onto you or other forms of, of uh, behavior onto you without your permission, without your say so. You know, if it's someone yelling at you from their car or someone touching you or following you, you haven't given permission for that interaction. Um, so I think, you know, a compliment or a, a positive interaction, someone genuinely wants you to be part of the conversation and they make sure that you feel safe and comfortable being part of that conversation. And, um, you know, maybe they'll come up to you and say, is it okay if I ask you a question? Is it okay if I... Um, say something to you to give you that agency and that option. Uh, to follow up further um, on what the the student was asking, the the, the person was asking. Uh, let's see, sorry, just looking at the question here. Yeah, I think all of you said good things about um, you know sharing your story with them so that they're aware of what you personally are experiencing and so they have a better understanding and aren't just pulling from stereotypes of what street harassment is and can really understand that it is having an impact on you. Um, I, uh, one of the best things that I've seen as far as you know, youth talking to each other was done by Girls for Gender Equity in Brooklyn um, two years ago for Anti-Street Harassment Week. They have teenagers who are their sisters in strength and they, um, they're all girls, and they decided to hold a three-hour workshop with boys in their lives, their brothers, their cousins, their male friends. And they came for, for this three hours, and they did talk with, um, it was facilitated with adults, and they talked about what the messages they get. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And how does that influence how they're feeling on the streets? Um, and... And, uh, and then they, the girls shared their stories, and it was a really positive experience. It was a safe place, and they really were able to get into these issues. Um, and so as far as the question that was asked, too, about how, how should I be an upstander to sexual harassment online? Um, so if you see harassment happening online, um, it depends on, of course, the platform where, where it's happening. But um, I know Twitter's getting much better about the reporting options and blocking people and you can, um, what is it called? It's like silence them so that you don't have to see them anymore. Facebook, now you can report things. There was a big campaign um, almost two years ago to get Facebook to finally start taking uh, posts about gender violence seriously before they used to classify it as humor. So now they do moderate for that and they will they'll take it seriously. I know it was like ridiculous. There was this. God bless their souls. <laughs> 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 they had to, um, activists had to work to get, um, they were able to take screenshots of pro-rate pages and you'd see all the companies whose ads would automatically appear and so they were able to get people to start tweeting those snapshots to the companies and say, did you know that your ad is appearing on a pro-rate page? And so those companies started pulling their funding and that is what got Facebook to finally take it seriously and change their policy. Anyway, so there is a way now on Facebook to report that because money talks. Um, email, you know, if you're getting harassed online, um, it, like by email, keep a record of it. And if you're mm -hmm. getting threats, um, uh, you know, definitely, definitely contact the police. Um, states are starting to catch up on their laws around cyber harassment and stalking. So um, if you can document, you know, what's happening and how it's making you feel, you can, you can take that to the police. Um, and I think another thing that we can all do is just be supportive of each other. Harassment is, genderized and sexualized harassment is a problem that disproportionately affects women online. And, um, and sometimes we just need a support group and people that we can turn to and say, I really 
I'm frustrated and upset. Um, can can you talk to me? So that that's definitely something we can all do to to help each other out. I can jump in uh, yeah, really quickly. Ahead. Wednesday, April fifteenth, which is next week, uh, the National Organization for Women and uh, a lot of other organizations are actually doing a brief um, in Capitol Hill about online harassment. Uh, there is a joint coordinated effort. Um, there will be uh, Zoe Quinn, who is who has received a lot of online harassment who will be at the briefing. Um, so women's rights groups are really getting together and trying to fight this. So if you want to get involved, if you want to help, um, feel free to send us an email. And we will um, we can let you know uh, what to do. Yeah, great. I'd love to get uh, more info on that. Maybe you can share that out with the group and the uh, people watching. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions, Sharon? Yeah, um, somebody asked. There, so there were times that they saw harassment and they didn't know like what to do. And obviously, there are different scenarios. But what is one like very simple thing that people can do where they they feel safe, but they also um, they're also helping the person being harassed? I think the first thing they can do is to listen to the um, to the victim's stories. That's that's a start. I think it's very simple, but you don't deny other people's experiences and feelings, and just try to be there, show that you're a supporter. I think that can be a very simple start to understanding how serious street harassment is. I think that ideally, um, if you're in a situation like you're with your friend and you see something is going on, someone's yelling you, in an ideal world, you'd be able to be like, hey, not cool. But I think the first thing you always need to consider is your safety. Um, even if you, you feel really strongly about something, um, it's more important to support your friend and make sure that you and whatever is going on um, are in a safe environment. But let's say having established that, um, Let's say you're at school and it's someone you know and he's doing something not cool and you know that you can, you know, talk to him. Um, I think that, at least in my experience, it's been good to talk to them privately, not in front of a whole bunch of their friends, not in front of, you know, the girl they have a crush on or whatever. Um, there's a conflict resolution uh, technique called the I method where you start off saying, you know, I'm you know, feeling a certain way, you're not trying to be like, you were doing this, this, and this. Because, you know, sometimes um, people don't understand. And it's it's terrible that we have to kind of be the ones to coach them through it, but sometimes that's where it is. So establishing that you do feel safe enough to talk to this person. Um, I would make it a private conversation. I would tell them how it makes you feel. Um, if they don't respond well, then I would let it go because, you know, it's not your responsibility to change people's minds, but um, mm -hmm. that is one way you can respond to that kind of situation. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, I mean, you, that's, a, that's a very important point. It's just um, making sure that you feel safe. That, that is the biggest, the biggest rule. I mean, like I said before when I was younger, I mean, just flipping someone off, that's not a safe alternative. Um, <laughs> as righteous as you feel when you're doing it. So I think that's a very important role. And as you said, doing it by yourself because it is often about power. And if their power feels threatened, they're most likely to react in a way that would just assert more power and do more harm. Um, and in scenarios where you don't feel safe, I think the best alternative is to just leave that situation. And sadly for some women, that means if you're walking down the street and you feel like someone's following you, you duck into a, a business. You tell the business owner or someone working there, hey, I don't feel safe. Um, if it truly gets to that degree, I mean, some people will follow you. You need to notify someone else that this is happening. Don't, by any means, take it under your responsibility to protect yourself and 
everything else you need to share. And that's why we need these safe spaces, and that's why street harassment needs to be taken seriously, so that when you go to someone and say, hey, I need your help, they'll understand why, and they'll actually help you. So, yeah, I think that's very important. So kudos to you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it, it, if you are able to check in with the person being harassed, that, that's a huge help. And um, it's just even creating a distraction or interruption or um, a fake friend tactic is, is uh, one of my favorites, pretending like you know the person being harassed and just starting to talk to them and just ignore the harasser, just engage um, you know, in friendly conversation with the person being harassed, uh, I think can help. And um, and if you do feel safe, if there are other people around, or if you have a friend with you, you could you know say something like, "Hey, that's not cool. That's harassment. You know, leave them alone." Um, something simple like that. Um, although it is a way to challenge their power, so it it could escalate. Um, there there may be a chance it would escalate compared to doing something like creating a distraction or an interruption. Um, the Stop Street Harassment website has a lot of tips for how you might try to respond to harassers, whether they are ones that are harassing you or someone you're seeing. Um, and I found that whatever you can do to surprise them is the least likely to escalate it. And for me personally, that has been just simply saying, don't harass me. <laughs> like It's so simple, but they're not expecting it. Um, and and it's, it's harder to escalate from that um, unless, I mean, if you're in a confined spot, then they might try to argue, but so I use that when I'm kind of walking and, and can keep moving on. Um, but there, there are a range of ways to, to try to uh, respond. Um, and just know that whatever you do try is, is okay. Um, there's no perfect answer. There's no right response. And even getting angry and flipping someone off, if it helps you get through it, like that helps you get through it, and that's a valid, valid way. Um, I, I know you, you know, feel, feel it could escalate, but honestly, there are also times where it escalates because you're silent, and they feel like you owe them a response. So it really depends on the harasser. So I say whatever helps you get through it and helps you be safe and feel empowered. That's that's the right response. Thank you, Holly. Um, so we have about two minutes left. Um, so I kind of just wanted to ask Holly. I know it's only two minutes, but maybe just talk a little bit about. What else is happening um, the rest of the week? And maybe if there are any quick um, comments the panelists wanted to add. Yeah, so just quickly, there are events happening in, in 36 countries, both offline and online. Um, for example, in Cameroon, Egypt, India, Zimbabwe, Serbia, USA, they're all holding events with teenagers and college students, which is, you know, that's come up a lot this evening. Countries like Mexico, Germany, and the U.S. are posting Stop Telling Women to Smile posters. Um, countries like France, Chile, Germany, Colombia, Romania, Brazil, and Nepal are holding marches and passing out info on subways and streets. Um, London is launching an anti-harassment transit campaign, and uh, groups in Korea and Nicaragua are releasing data and reports on street harassment. So those are a lot of the, the mostly offline events, um, but there are going to be tweet chats every single day um, this week, including one hosted by the, the now young feminists and their allies on Friday at 1, uh, no wait, is it changed to 12? 12 p.m. Yeah, 12 p.m. Um, and, and so check out the meetusonthestreet.org website to see all the other tweet chats. And, uh, and if you want to get involved um, just now, even if you're not in an area where an event's happening, um, get a piece of chalk and go outside and write a message and take a photo and, and send it in, um, and, you know, tweet it out or put it on Facebook. And then also, the Stop Telling Women to Smile posters are available. You can request them for download. And um, Tatiana, the artist, is encouraging people to post them in their neighborhoods on Friday. So lots of ways to get involved. Well, thank you so much, Holly. And Kasumi, Munira, and Morningstar, thank you so, so much for joining us, especially Kasumi. I know it's super early morning in Japan, and you took a day off from work. Thank you. Um, we are just about out of time, but I really want to thank everybody. Please check out Hallie's wonderful website, Meet Us on the Street, for uh, tools, tips, and more events coming up. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.